Many of you, as you are coming in today, uh, but I'm the program assistant for the Extreme History Project, uh, and it gives me great pleasure to be able to do the introduction uh, today, since Crystal will be our, our speaker. Um, but before I do that, I want to tell you about a really exciting event that is coming up in just a few weeks here, uh, October 18th. We will be once again uh, hosting our History After Dark uh, event in downtown Bozeman. Uh, so this is your chance to um, uh, walk through the streets of Bozeman and meet some of the historic characters who will be uh, presenting in first person, dressed up in costume uh, as, as the sun sets uh, in Bozeman. So please come out and, and uh, see us for that. Our tickets are on sale now and you can uh, find that through our Facebook page and um, through Eventbrite. Uh, I also want to thank First Interstate Bank uh, for generously sponsoring uh, this lecture tonight. We can't do the work we do all year long uh, without uh, the help and financial support from our uh, community. So a big thank you to them and also to the Montana L Works, who is also generously providing a dinner for our speaker tonight. So thank you, Montana L Works. And uh, finally to KGB. BM, uh, our community radio station, for always recording these lectures and providing that uh, hello uh, to uh, the public uh, through the radio station. Um, but without further ado, let me uh, introduce Crystal. Uh, Crystal Alegria is the director of the Extreme History Project, uh, which is our nonprofit uh, here in Bozeman that brings history to the public in fun, engaging, and relevant ways. Uh, she has worked in the field of public history and archaeology education uh, for the last 20 years at a variety of museums and heritage organizations. And she co-founded the Extreme History Project in 2012 uh, with a colleague, Marsha Fulton, and has helped build this organization into an award-winning nonprofit that engages the public in history uh, through walking tours, a lecture series, uh, workshops, oral history, preservation projects, and other unique historical programming. So Crystal serves on Bozeman's Historic Preservation Advisory Board and has also written many articles and blogs on the history of Bozeman. Uh, she has a BS in Anthropology and an MA in History uh, from Montana State University, and uh, Crystal is local. She grew up uh, in Livingston, Montana, and although she will always uh, have a love for the Paradise Valley, she now calls Bozeman home. And she lives here with her husband, Larry, <laughs> who's in the audience today, and uh, their two teenage children, Emily and Lawson. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn the podium over to Crystal.
document in a very beautiful way using stone, landscape, nature, and architecture. And all these things come together to show us what people in a community really care about. So we're going to be talking a little bit about um, the beauty of these and the artwork in Sunset Hill Cemetery tonight. So I love cemeteries, like I just said. So who else in the crowd loves cemeteries? Raise your hand. Oh my gosh, almost oh, every hand is raised. Yay. So um, there's a name for all of us. <laughs> it is actually, um, <laughs> the official name for those who love cemeteries is tapophiles. And so we, there are many tapophiles in this, in this crowd tonight. And so um, I'm glad you're here with me to talk a little bit about these wonderful cemeteries. So this is a photo of me um, in front of the headstone in Salem, Massachusetts. And this is a really beautiful headstone. Um, there's, on the East Coast, if you go into any cemetery on the East Coast, you will come across one of these slate headstones. And they're just gorgeous. Um, this is a very typical looking headstone from the 1760 to 1810 time period. This headstone depicts a very common symbol, the winged cherub. And this image that you see here, this winged cherub image, that you can see right up at the head of the tombstone with the wings and the little cherub face there. Um, this image transformed over time from a winged death's head or a winged skull looking figure to this more pleasant cherub looking figure. And um, the reason for that is because, um, for that transition is because in the earlier days, there was more of a focus on death. And when I say that, the focus on death was that um, people knew that death was coming, you never knew when you were going to die, so live life to the fullest while you can, and make sure that you live a good and proper life. So that was kind of what that death's head symbolized to people. But as time went on, they moved towards a stronger belief in salvation and resurrection. And so that is why that, I, the cherub kind of took the place of that death's head. So that's a little symbolism on those slate headstones. We're, we're not gonna focus much on those tonight. We're gonna move on to, to some more uh, Western ideologies. Um, we at Extreme History Project do a lot of work in cemeteries. We've been doing a big project over in the Nevada City Cemetery, which is close to Virginia City, Nevada City, Montana. We've been doing a project there for about the last five, six, seven years, documenting and, and preserving that pioneer cemetery, that early, early cemetery. And we are this summer working on uh, oral histories, an oral history project around that cemetery, kind of speaking to some of the people who had descendants in that cemetery, but then also talking to people who just know a lot about that cemetery, the history of that cemetery. So we're gonna work those oral histories into a podcast, and my colleague Nancy Mahoney, who's sitting here, um, is working with me on that. So watch for that in the next year, because that's gonna be really, really amazing. And so as, you know, over the years, as I've been wandering through cemeteries, as we all, I think, like to do, I've noticed uh, the beautiful artwork on the headstones and started to wonder what all of the symbolism on these headstones meant. So a few years ago, I started diving into this a little deeper and created a walking tour for Sunset Hill Cemetery and the symbolism in the cemetery. And so uh, that's kind of what this presentation derives from. But if you've gone on that walk with me, uh, you'll learn a lot more because I've added a few different things in here tonight. So you'll still get to see some different symbolism. But this symbolism really gives us insight into the community values of 19th century Montana and 19th century Bozeman. So I just want to talk really quickly here about symbols. And so can anyone tell me what is a symbol? Just shout out what a simple definition for a symbol. A representation. Right. A representation. Yes, very good. Anyone want to elaborate on that? That's pretty good. <laughs> so it is, it's, it's something that represents or stands for something else, especially a material object representing something abstract. So that's what a symbol is. So I'm going to test your knowledge on some symbols. So this is an easy one. What is this? Peace. Peace. Peace sign, right. So that's easy, isn't it? Oh, there's Mary right there. Maybe Mary give away. <laughs> She's the person who facilitated the sponsor.
sponsorship for tonight. <laughs> okay, what does this symbol mean? Power. Oh, power, right, right. So the, um, actually the logic behind this symbol is that I have the binary, binary state, the zero and the one. And the zero represents an open circuit. So when the open circuit is running, the, the electronics is on. And then the line re represents a closed circuit. So that's what that symbol um, means. Okay, what's the symbol? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Logos are symbols too. <laughs> and so of course, this is the logo for um, Starbucks, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And this uh, logo um, really represents something abstract to all of us, and it might represent something very different to all of us as well. But um, this company, Starbucks, was named after the first mate in the novel, Moby Dick. His name was Starbuck, so that's where they got the name for Starbucks. Due to this nautical name, the logo was designed to reflect the seductive imagery of the sea. So that's kind of a seductive image, isn't it? Um, an early creative partner at Starbucks dug through some old marine archives until he found an image of a siren from the 16th century Nordic woodcut. And it was a twin-tailed mermaid, so you can kind of see the twin tails coming up. So a, a twin-tailed mermaid or siren. So, you know, I always think, well, sometimes Starbucks lures me in for the cappuccino <laughs> <laughs> latte or whatever it is. So, <laughs> definitely. What is this one? They're going to get a little harder. Prince. Prince, yay. That's exciting. You guys knew that. Um, so this is, this is Prince, the sign for Prince. So in 1993... The artist Prince, the singer Prince, announced that he would no longer go by the name Prince, but instead wanted to go by this sign or this symbol. He was having a little dispute with his record label, and I think that's what it maybe stemmed from. But he said that this symbol represented love. And so you can kind of see that it has the two gender symbols, male and female, kind of mashed up in there. And so this, um, to him, represents love. And, um, and he also said, quote, it's all about thinking in new ways, tuning into a new frequency. So a little, little sentence from Prince there. But in 2000, after his contract with Warner Brothers, his record label was done, he went back to using his name Prince, which was kind of a I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, now, one more here. What is that one? The Deathly Hollows. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought you would put that. Oh, that's great. Great. Yes, so for you Harry Potter fans in the room, um, you will instantly recognize this because this plays a large pot part in the Harry Potter series. So this symbol is comprised of the Elder Wand, which is the, the line in the middle, the Resurrection Stone, which is the circle, and the Cloak of, of Invisibility, which is the triangle aspect of this, of this symbol. So whoever, it is said in the books, whoever possesses all three of these is said to be the master of death. So this appeared in the sixth book of the Harry Potter series. So uh, this has really become part of our culture. This has really become part of our mythology. And this symbol is added to our mythology. And as I've been putting together this <coughs> talk, I've been really looking for these symbols, these popular cultural cu culture symbols. And I've seen this image tattooed on numerous people. <laughs> so they're kind of of a younger generation, but they have these this symbol tattooed. I saw it on the, the back of a calf and then I saw it on an arm. So it's really interesting how um, younger um, generations are taking this in. But you know, it makes sense because I think my daughter has read the entire series, which I think completes eight books, seven books, eight books. Um, she's read it three times through. So it's being ingrained. So it is definitely part of our culture, which is so interesting. Just like the Lord of the Rings with Tolkien was um, for a few, uh, for a previous generation. Okay, so symbols change over time, don't they? And um, so, um, example, until 2007, we used this symbol to represent the number sign or the pound sign. No longer. <laughs> In 2007, Chris Messina, a gentleman named Chris Messina, proposed using this symbol to associate or group messages 
on social media, especially on Twitter. The hashtag, as it is now known, is a type of metadata tag that allows us to find messages easily on social media. So this hashtag that we now use, we can put that before a word and then we can easily find that theme or that idea or those words within other social media messages. So it's really transformed. We still use this as the number sign or the pound sign, but now it's also known as the hashtag. And so this I thought was interesting. This is the original tweet um, from Chris Messina. He said, how do you feel about using the pound sign for groups as in hashtag bar camp? And that started it all. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Okay. So now we've talked a little bit about symbols. So you, we have, we have, we kind of um, um, set you in, into the symbol mode so that we can start looking at cemetery symbolism. So here's, um, I just, and I also wanted to just set you kind of in the context of the cemetery that we're going to be working in, and kind of the the time frame that we're going to be um, looking at as well. So we're going to dive into Sunset Hill Cemetery, which used to be called the Bozeman Cent Cemetery. It wasn't called Sunset Hills until probably the 1920s or so. And we're going to be looking at the old section of the cemetery. So this can really tell us about um, what people were thinking in the mid 1860s to 1900s. So that's kind of our time frame we're going to be looking at, mid 1860s to early 1900s. Symbolism in the cemetery can give us a lot of clues about that, that community values, those community values that I talked about before. So I want to give you a little bit of a history quiz here. So when was Bozeman founded? Anyone know the year? 1864. Oh, I heard it over here. Someone said 1864. Oh, my dad did. <laughs> 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 right, so Bozeman was founded, founded in 1864. So kind of think about what was happening in our country in 1864. And so why do you think people were coming here to settle in Bozeman in 1864? Gold. I heard gold out there. Yeah, you're exactly right. So people were rushing to, to Montana to uh, mine gold in Bannock, in Helena, in Virginia City. They were coming out here to go to those places to strike it rich, and not many of them did, but they tried. And so um, Bozeman was actually founded to supply those places with agricultural goods and other supplies that those miners needed on their way. So Bozeman wasn't a mining town, but instead it was an agricultural town. So if you're thinking about all those people who were coming here, there was a lot of non-Native people coming here. Of course, Native people had been here for thousands of years before this, but at this time there was a lot of non-Native people coming here from all over the world, coming here from um, Sweden, from Germany, they were coming from the East Coast of the United States, they were coming from Ohio, they were coming from New York. They were all coming here to Bozeman, and most of these people who were coming here had a, a Christian, background. And so that's what we're going to be looking at with these symbols today. Many of these symbols we're going to see go back farther in time than Christianity. But because the people who are coming here and settling here practice Christianity, that is how they were using the symbols. So I'm going to kind of focus on that. I might go back in time um, with a few of these symbols, but I'll probably stick to pretty close to that Christian ideology. Okay, and this is a picture of Sunset Hill Cemetery, um, the, the grave of Mary Blackmore from 1901. And this is one of the only photos I have that I've, I've found of the cemetery from the late 1800s, early 1900s. But it shows a little different view of the cemetery than we see today, doesn't it? With the tall grass and the little white picket fences around the headstones, and that was because of course, there was a lot of cows grazing up there at this time, and they tried to keep the cows from pushing over the, the headstones by putting these little fences around them. Okay, here is our first symbol, the weeping willow, Appropriate, appropriately named the weeping willow, because uh, when you look at that image, you just feel sorrow, don't you? You just feel sorrow and grief, and you can really... Um, feel that, that tree just kind of bending down and its leaves almost touching the ground. So definitely uh, the weeping willow represents 
sorrow and grief, but it also represents immortality. And that really comes back to that idea of the tree of life. And so all trees kind of have that idea of the tree of life and that, that idea of immortality, but um, the weeping willow um, definitely does, and I'll tell you why. But the weeping willow often, it, and this is one of our oldest symbols in the cemetery. So this symbol, this weeping willow symbol, you might see also on those slate headstones that I talked about at the beginning that are on the East Coast. You see a lot of um, weeping willows with urns in, in association with urns. And so this is one of the symbols that really traveled west with the people who were coming here. Not a lot of symbols did. The death's head and the cherub, the winged cherub definitely did not, but this weeping willow did. And so it is um, a very popular decoration um, here in Sunset Hill Cemetery. You'll see it quite a bit. It's also sometimes associated with lambs and crosses here in the West. The weeping willow was a native of Asia. The tree is a native of Asia. And it's a really very fast growing tree. It can reach 50 feet high and 50 feet wide very quickly. It tolerates most any soil and roots very easily from cuttings. Because of this, they are often the first trees to appear in a disturbed site, giving them a reputation for healers and renewers. So it was very common to place willow branches in coffins of the dead, um, and then plant the young saplings on the graves with the belief that the spirit of the dead would rise up through the tree. So, the weeping willow. Okay, we're gonna keep on our our theme, our plant theme, and, and go to flora next. We're going to look at some flowers. And of course, flowers are represented in the cemetery um, quite frequently. And then we have some wheat also. So I'm gonna start right here with this wheat. And you can see this headstone, this beautiful headstone, with a stalk of wheat up there at the, the top. And wheat, uh, there is a lot of wheat in Sunset Hills. That is because we are an agricultural community. And wheat is very, was very important, and still is very important to this community. So we, we see a lot of wheat in our cemetery. Uh, if you go to a cemetery in Wisconsin or Iowa, you see a lot of corn represented because of course corn is very important to those communities. So wheat was, uh, is one thing that you see a lot of. There's also a lot of calla lilies. So you can see the calla lily here. There's a calla lily here. And calla lilies um, symbolize majestic beauty and marriage. So you can see those. And, and if you look at the, the calla lily, it re really does represent, um, you can really see that majestic beauty. They're so large and so big and so white. The Easter lily was also very important in cemeteries. And I don't have a picture of an Easter lily up here, but it symbolized purity. And the Easter lilies were also important for practical reasons. Lilies were often used at funerals in physical form, um, actually having lilies, um, Easter lilies at the funeral because of the strong scent um, that they have, which can overpower other strong scents that often occurred at funerals in the 1800s. So um, unfortunately, we did not have embalming until about the 18, kind of mid 1880s here. So before that, um, if the corpse started to um, decompose, it was important to have very strong scented flowers at the funeral um, so, that, so that you could um, mask those odors. So the Easter lily was perfect for that. So I'll talk a little bit about the laurel wreath, which you can see right up here. And the laurel wreath actually represents victory over death and eternity. And so you'll always see a laurel wreath at the top, or any kind of wreath, a, a wreath of flowers at the top of a headstone, because it kind of symbolize, symbolizes that idea of victory or that crowning victory. And so you'll see that right up here. And this one, had, the laurel wreaths usually are not closed at the top. They are kind of open. And that really, um, you can really see that, um, that sign of victory. Also, the laurel le leaves do not wilt or fade. And so that is that association with eternity. Okay, let's keep going here. Okay, hands, we're gonna talk a little bit about hands. And as people, we have always been fascinated with hands. We use our hands every day. We use our hands almost every minute of every day. And so they are very important to us. 
and some of our earliest artwork represents hands. This is an example of artwork from a cave in Indonesia that is symbolizing hands. This is over, this rock art dates to about 39,000 years ago. So <clears throat> hands are, were important then to us and they are definitely important to us now and more important to the people um, being buried in Sunset Hill Cemetery. Look at all those hands. <laughs> there is a lot of hands in Sunset Hills. Um, you'll see hands holding hearts, you'll see hands clasped, you'll see hands, fingers pointing down, you'll see fingers pointing up, you'll see all these things. So I'm gonna start with Mary Ferguson, which is right, oops, which is right here. And uh, there she is right here. Died at 27 years old. And as I'm going through this, you'll notice some of the death dates. People were very young. And I just kind of random, I didn't pick those people out, but that that was the, the that's just what happened in early Bozeman. But uh, Mary Ferguson, 27 years old when she died, and she has the hand with the heart in the middle of it. And this is a symbol of charity given with an open heart. You'll see the finger pointing up, and that is this one right here. And uh, this finger pointing up, the index finger pointing up, symbolizes the hope of heaven. While a hand with the index finger pointing down, well, it doesn't mean what you think it might mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, the index finger pointing down means that um, God is reaching down to pull you up into heaven. Mm -hmm. So that's what that means. And often that hand is the hand of God. That hand with the finger pointing up is the hand of God. Now, sometimes we don't have one of these in our cemetery, but sometimes if there's a hand with, instead of one finger, two fingers, that means that the person was actually a minister or a priest. So um, fingers can mean different things in different cemeteries too. Um, so if the finger points down, sometimes it re represents an untimely death as well. So then we have the clasped hands, and that is, we have two examples of those right here. And that is the handshake, sometimes called the handshake, and it is a very Victorian symbol and means a farewell to earthly existence and God's welcome into heaven. It can also represent a relationship between the deceased and the loved ones that they left behind. Sometimes you see the sleeves of the hand and can recognize that one is mas masculine and one is feminine. And so you see that right here. You see the frill on one side and the more mascul masculine cuff on the other side. So this re represents holy matrimony or the eternal unity of a husband and a wife. Sometimes the hand on top or the arm position slightly higher than the other hand indicates that the person, that that person passed away first and is now guiding their loved one into the next life. So, so all sorts of um, interesting symbolism. And then this one, you'll see there's a finger po pointing down. And so Jake Oakwood was one of our early sheriffs. And so they, they say that sometimes those fingers pointing out symbolize that that person was a mason. And that might go back to that secret mason handshake. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So um, that is the hands. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the gates ajar. And as you can see on these headstones, we have a lot of these headstones in Sunset Hill Cemetery that show that um, the gates of heaven kind of just left open, just ajar. And so you see it there, and then you see it here too, and this one has a dove above it. So the gates ajar, this is a very popular symbol, the gates ajar, and this is a symbol that is popular throughout the nation, but we see it a lot in Sunset Hills. This is a direct result, this symbol is a direct result of a novel called The Gates Ajar that was published in 1868 by Elizabeth Stuart Phelps. The story follows a young woman who is grieving the loss of her brother who died in the Civil War. She finds solace from her aunt who tells her that the gates of heaven are not closed, but always remain open, just ajar. That way souls can pass back and forth between heaven and earth. In this way, loved ones who have passed are always able to observe friends and family who are among the living. So Phelps wrote, Phelps wrote this book in the last years of the Civil War, grieving the loss of her own mother, her stepmother, and her fiance who died at Antietam Battlefield. 
So you can imagine that this Gates Ajar book um, really um, took hold of all these people who were grieving husbands and sons and brothers after the Civil War, and it really um, pulled them in. And to have this idea that you know you could still observe, um, or that your loved ones who had gone up to heaven could still observe you here on earth, and that maybe you could reach to them in some way or another, was very popular. And that was part of that spiritualism movement as well, that people were starting to go to seances to see if they could connect with their loved one who was beyond the veil. And so this is really part of that whole idea of being able to talk just one last time to your loved one who died in the Civil War. And so this um, took our country by storm, and everyone really bought into this Gates Ajar ideology, and that even in England and parts of Europe, this was very popular. And so um, I'll just move to the next slide here. So not only were there tombstones with the symbolism on them, but also flower arrangements. There were many songs composed about the Gates Ajar, and then even in Anaconda, um, someone on their in their window display during Easter had uh, displayed Easter hats in the form of the gates ajar. So, <laughs> so it was everywhere. Um, so the gates ajar, kind of interesting. Okay, so now I'm excited to talk about tree stones because I love tree stones. <laughs> we have five of them in Sunset Hill Cemetery, and not one of them is the same. They are all very different. And they all kind of have the same look to them. Of course, they all are an oak tree, an oak stump. And sometimes the oak stump is taller than other times. Um, all of our oak stumps in Sunset Hill Cemetery are about the same size. And this is pretty large. It's about six feet tall, I would say. So these are large um, monuments in our cemetery. And when you come upon them, they are very monumental. But the um, tree stones were popular from the 1890s to the 1910s, and they were part of that Victorian rustic movement, as you can really see here from this, from this tree stone. And they were associated, these tree stones were actually associated with some fraternal organizations. Not always, though. Um, I think we always think they were associated with the woodmen of the world or the modern woodmen of America, but they weren't always. But um, here in Bozeman, oftentimes they were. So the, uh, these two fraternal organizations that I just talked about, the um, Woodmen of the World, were, they were formed in 1890, and the Modern Woodmen of America were founded in 1883. And so these were our fraternal organizations, kind of like the Masons, kind of like the Odd Fellows, kind of like the Knights of Pythias. They were formed in order for this group of men, they were a, a men's group mostly, um, they were formed in order to actually help the community and do good works in the community. And so we had, um, we had three groups here um, in Bozeman in the 1900, um, actually it was the 1902 city directory. We had the Women of Woodcraft, which was kind of another group, a woman's auxiliary group and the jewels circle number 131 was here in Bozeman. We had the Women of the World, Bridger Camp number 62, and Modern Women of America, Gallatin Camp number 5245. So those are the three that we had here in Bozeman. And you can see on here that this, this um, person um, had the Modern Women of America acronym on his headstone as well as the ax. All these wood woodmen, um, what they would do for their ritual is they would um, march together with axes <laughs> down the street, which is kind of interesting. And um, they would do drills with axes. And it was kind of hearkening back to that idea of the um, days when the um, pioneers were setting out across America to clear the land for civilization. And so that was their, their kind of the, the thought process that they had with these so it's a really interesting group. If you want to learn more, there's so much more to know about the, the woodmen of the world as well. I'm just touching on some of these things here, but if you want to know more, there's a lot out there. We don't currently have any. Uh, the Woodmen of the World organization is still thriving. They also had a death benefit um, insurance. And so you could be a member of the Woodmen of the World, and then you're, in the early days, your whole funeral was paid for. 
Um, that got kind of expensive for the organization. <laughs> so then they actually just started giving you $100 for your funeral. So that was a really good deal. And so that was a perk of the membership. So the um, Women of the World is still in existence, but more as an insurance agency nowadays. And we don't have any of these lodges or these circles left or these camps left here at Bozeman today. So I want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to move to the next one. So these are just three of the, with the tree stones that we have here in Sunset Hills. And um, you'll see that they kind of all have this scroll um, giving the information about the, the um, person who passed away. This one I write, I like right here, his name was Royal Haxton. What a name, huh? Um, and uh, only died at age 34 years old. But um, you'll see that the, there's a stag at the top of this headstone. There's also um, some of the same symbolism, a, a fern here, a fern here. This one has a cow and lily. So like I said, they're all kind of different. Now I'm gonna go to the next um, slide. We're gonna look at a little bit more detail of that middle stone. So you'll see that um, on some of these stones, there was a, an owl. So you see the owl here, it's kind of peeking out at you from the stone. And the owl symbolized wisdom, solitude, and watchfulness. They remind the faithful that Christ can guide our souls even through the darkest of times. So that's what the owl symbolized. There was also the symbolism of the ivy. So on a lot of these stones, they have ivy kind of clinging, wrapping their way up up the tree stone. And so the ivy is an evergreen plant, which speaks to immortality again, and also that idea of life after death. Ivy claims to support, um, to a support, which makes it a symbol of attachment, friendship, and undying affection. Its three-pointed leaves also hearken to the symbol of the Trinity. Of course, these are all oak trees that they um, are on. This is an oak tree. These are carved out, carved out of limestone, by the way. Um, and the oak tree was the king of trees. It symbolized strength, endurance, eternity, honor, and virtue. So that is what the oak tree symbolized, as well as the oak leaves. And then the fern down below here, you can see those fern leaves. The fern symbolized humility, frankness, and sincerity because ferns are found deep in the forest and found only by those who have honestly searched. So, um, and then you see the anchor as well. Now you'd think that the anchor would mean um, something nautical, something of the sea, but actually in this case, on headstones, it often means hope. It symbolizes hope. Hope for the, hope to go to heaven, um, hope in different ways. And so, uh, so that is what that, um, that big anchor right there symbolizes. So um, we do this, this we, we do our walking tour with um, students sometimes in Sunset Hill Cemetery. One, one year I was doing this with a group of students and we were looking at, um, we were looking at Royal Haxton here and his, his headstone. And so I kind of went through and told them what all this meant. And the, a little boy said, oh, so he was a very humble man who, um, was interested in um, and, and who had a lot of friends. And he just really put all that together to symbolize who this man was in life. And of course, that was really neat because that's what, the, that's what they were trying to get across is who these people were that had died. So that is the tree stones. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the masons. And I could probably do an hour talk on the symbology of the masons. Um, do we have any masons in the room? Oh good, I'm glad. Oh no, we didn't have one, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I get this right. <laughs> um, so Masonic, Masonic symbolism is abundant in Sunset Hill Cemetery. Like I said, I could do a whole hour just on, on this. But the Masons are the largest fraternal organization in the world. And Bozeman currently has two lodges and historically has always had two lodges. Lodges number six, which is located in the building that has the horse that spins around at the corner of Maine and Bozeman, I think it is. Is that right? Maine yeah. and Bozeman. And then lodge number 18 is at the corner of Maine and Tracy, so just down the street uh, a little ways. And of course, you may have heard this before, but um, Bozeman was settled in 1864 when the war was raging, the Civil War 
was raging. And so there was still a little animosity between the northerners and the southerners here in Bozeman when they settled these lodges or when they organized these lodges. And so um, we had to have two lodges, one for the northerners and one for the southerners. <laughs> and so the way that I remember this is that the, the lodge for the southerners is on the north side of the street and the lodge for the northerners was on the south side of the street. So, <laughs> Um, so anyway, so we still had two very active lodges here in Bozeman, um, Masonic lodges. So this symbol that you see up here, the compass in the square with the G in the middle, is a very common symbol, and you see this all over the cemetery. And um, Sunset Hill Cemetery has a whole Masonic section, but there are masons buried throughout the entire cemetery and have this symbol and other symbols on it on the headstones as well. And so this, um, um, this symbol, the square and the com compass, um, they symbolize morality and virtue, respectively. So, uh, and just to give you a little bit of a, um, um, some, a little bit of information on what the Masons do, they, their goal um, is to take good men and make them better through fortitude, justice, prudence, and integrity. So um, this last weekend, I had the opportunity to go to Virginia City, and I met a Mason who was a, a Mason here in Bozeman for many years. His name was Bill Bennett, and um, Nancy and I were doing some oral history <coughs> in Virginia City, and we just happened to cross him, and he is the one who kind of manages the, the Masonic Hall in Virginia City. And he was a Mason here for many years, but now he lives in Virginia City, so he is a Mason there. And so we happened upon him in the post office and, <laughs> and started talking and found out who he was and that he managed the Masonic Hall. And so he said, do you guys want to come up and look at it? And we said, yes, we sure do. And so we went up and this Masonic Hall was formed in 1867. It's one of the oldest Masonic Halls in Montana. And it was built and constructed in 1867, and not much has changed since then. They did put in new carpeting in 1913. <laughs> so it was beautiful, it was beautiful. And it had these gorgeous chandeliers that had this Masonic um, sign on them. And he took us through the whole thing and explained all the, the um, symbolism of all the things that were in that Masonic Hall. So if you ever get a chance while you're in Virginia City, go look at that one. But I know that um, the Masonic Hall here in Bozeman is open as well. The one on the corner of Tracy and Maine, um, been invited into that one as well. So go, if you have a chance, go in and look, because it's un just, be they're beautiful, and then the, um, the symbolism and the meaning behind everything is really so interesting. So um, the G in the middle, I was gonna come back and tell you that the G in the middle um, represents God and or geometry. So that's what that symbolizes. And to be a Mason, you don't have to, um, um, you have to believe in God or you have to believe in a higher power. I'll just say that. Um, it could be any higher power. You just have to believe in a higher power. Okay, so let's move on. And we're going to talk about um, another one of these orders, and they call this a fraternal order, but that's, it was, this, this order, the Royal Neighbors of America, was not actually started by men, but it was actually started by women. So there was a group of nine women who got together one day, and they were talking, and they were saying, oh, our, our husbands are all part of the Woodmen of America, or the, the Masons, or the Odd Fellows, and we need a group like and so they came up with this group called the Royal Neighbors of America. And it's very simil to, similar to any other fraternal order. And they also focus on insurance. And so they focused on insurance for women and supporting women. And so they were very, um, you know, which was a real need in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, is that they, um, women who are widows especially, really needed death insurance so that they could be buried, so their family members could be buried. And so um, so the Royal Neighbors of America were an, an important um, order, fraternal order. They do call them a fraternal order, but I'd rather call them a maternal order. <laughs> um, but this symbol is really interesting. And so you can see the symbol here. And I had to do some digging to, to find these Royal Neighbors of America. And, but I found out that this acronym stands for Faith, 
stretching over here, endurance, courage, modesty, and, and unselfishness with the U over there. So that is their motto. And this organization is still going as well, and they are now more in that insurance business, but they also give scholarships to young women for business, um, going to school in business. So that's kind of what they've moved into more recently. Okay, and then the last uh, order I'm gonna talk about is the International Order of the Odd Fellows. So this order is very similar to the Masons, and sometimes they're called the Poor Man's Mason. Uh, I've heard them called that. But this is their symbol, the three-link chain that is right up here. And that three-link chain symbolizes friendship, love, and truth. And sometimes you see those that acronym within the chains of that three-link chain. And the Odd Fellows also had a section in Sunset Hills Cemetery. And um, let me turn my page here. But unfortunately, the Odd Fellows, unlike the Masons, haven't continued here in Bozeman. So we no longer have a chapter here in Bozeman. Um, I think there is one in Great Falls, but um, and that might be the only one, that, the one that is in Great Falls. So the Odd Fellows, unlike the Masons, don't require you to have a belief in a higher power. So you can be an atheist and join the Odd Fellows. And so, um, and also death insurance was a part of the Odd Fellows. But the Odd Fellows, unlike the Masons, were more about community. The Masons were more about building yourself as a person, as a man. The Odd Fellows were more about um, building in the community. And there was also, there was for the Masons and for the um, Odd Fellows, there was the women's auxiliary groups that were, um, that were part of that as well. But as a woman, you cannot be a Mason or you cannot be an Odd Fellow. Okay, so I haven't really talked about the people behind these headstones, but I, I'm going to tell you this story about this person. So you'll see here that this is um, the headstone of Adolf Spieth. His name was K. Adolf Spieth. And so when I was drawn to this headstone because of the symbol, I started looking at his information and I noticed that he died at 29 years old, and I thought, oh my gosh, what happened to him? He died so young. And then I walked around the headstone, and I saw that his wife was listed on the, the other side of the headstone, and her name was Margareta. And she died, so he died in November 21st, 1891. Margareta died in December of 1891. And then I circled, kept circling around the headstone, and I saw that a little son of theirs, who was only five months old, died in July of 1891. So I thought, oh my goodness, what happened here? I've got to find the story. So I went immediately back and searched their obituary. I came across um, this obit, and this was for Margareta. So you can see her headstone, or her sign over here, and then little Herman over here. But I'll just read this, because um, it kind of tells the story. So in Bozeman, Friday, December 19th, 1890. Now, on the headstone, it says 1891. So don't always believe everything you see written in stone. Because <laughs> it wasn't 1891, it was actually 1890 when they died. But in, in Bozeman, Friday, December 19th, 1890, of typhoid fever, Margaret, widow of the late K. Adolf Spieth, the remains were interred in the Bozeman Cemetery on Sunday, just one month from the death of her husband. The death is made more sad from the fact that the three small children, one boy and two girls, are left orphans. We are informed by Dr. Higgins, who was the attending physician during the last illness, that he examined the well water used by the family and found it to contain organic and animal matter. We also learned that G.W. Hindsmith's family, who formerly occupied the house, experienced considerable sickness while living there. So that tells the story of the Speed family, unfortunately. So they died of typhoid fever. And so the, the three children that were orphaned actually went back to Germany because um, Speed, Adolf, and Margareta both had come here from Germany. So the three orphans were sent back to family in Germany. So they actually left the country then after the death of their parents, which is so sad. So I'm gonna continue with tragedy. And I'm gonna talk about, um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the grave of a child. Um, and this is a heart-wrenching, I tell you what, this is a heart-wrenching grave of a child, as they all are, of little Jamie Yerkes. 
So Jamie, um, this is the grave of Jamie, and you can see that one high top button shoe stands upright, while the other one is kind of setting um, off to the side, lying on its side. You can see one sock is hanging over the edge. This is the front of the headstone, this is the back. So you see one sock kind of laying over the front, one laying over the back. And you can just imagine this little boy running into his house, yanking off his shoes, his socks, and throwing them down, and this is where they landed. And it's just um, sorrowful that, that he will never put those little socks and shoes back on again. So this little boy, Jamie, died in 1890, and he was five and a half years old. Um, but unfortunately, his father was not in Montana when he died. His father was actually suffering a grave illness um, and while on a trip in New York City. So um, his father didn't even learn about Jamie's passing until about a month after the little boy died because that was when he became well enough to um, come out of his illness and come back to Montana. So can you imagine the, the mother who had to deal with um, her son passing away and then her, her husband, very sick in New York at the same time. So this was a time, this was a hard time in Bozeman, Montana. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about offerings and remembrances. And so I love this, I have a background in archeology. span And so these little artifacts that are left at graves are so fascinating to me. And there's a lot of them on modern graves. As you, if you go into a cemetery now, you see flowers and mobiles and little um, vases left and all sorts of little things left in cemeteries. But in the historic section of the cemetery, you don't always see a lot of, of grave offerings, but every once in a while you'll get lucky and you'll see something. And so, um, so these are just three things that I've seen over the last couple summers in Sunset Hill Cemetery. So here on this Quinn grave, you'll see a pineapple, <laughs> a pineapple. So um, kind, of, kind of an interesting thing to see on a grave, but there it is. And so I don't know what the pineapple means, but I do know that symbolically the pineapple traditionally has always represented hospitality. So maybe the Quinn family was very hospitable, something, something like that, I don't know, but there is a pineapple on the grave. Also, you see on um, this, this one over here on the right-hand side, the Nelson grave, you see that there are teaspoons left on the top of the grave. And so I've always wondered, was Mrs. Nelson a very good baker? <laughs> and so did they leave those teaspoons for her on the grave because of that? I don't know. Um, but you, we can just conjecture about some of these things. This grave right here has little stones left on it, little stones and a stick. And stones are often left and have been left for eternity on, on graves. And it goes back, um, indigenous people, both here in the Americas and in Europe, whenever someone was buried, when they were passing by the grave, they would leave a stone. And pretty soon there would be a large mound of stones um, forming a cairn, a cairn of stones at this grave. So we still see that today. I see this all the time on John Bozeman's grave. People will leave stones on that grave all the time. So, um, so a, a little bit about the, um, the remembrances as well. Okay, so this is um, taken from the City of Bozeman Sunset Hill Cemetery website. And this is an interactive map. If I was on the internet here, I could click on one of these little squares and it would pop up who the person is that is buried in that grave. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, if you, if you don't know about this, this is a, a very interesting tool to use. And so I have, and it shows the entire cemetery, I have just honed in on the historic section here. But um, this is a great tool for, for historians and genealogists and, and um, anyone who's interested in the cemetery. Okay. Let me get back to where I am. Okay. So as we come to the end of the presentation, we've looked at symbolism presented throughout, and we see that in the late 19th century Bozeman, there was an emphasis on coming together as a community, joining together to build this town. Many of these people came to Bozeman from other countries, like the Spieth family that came from Germany, or from other parts of the United States, people coming from um, all sorts of different states, the Midwest, Ohio, all, all sorts of different places. 
And so by joining those fraternal organizations like the Masons, the Odd Fellows, the Royal Neighbors of America, Women of the World, uh, they had a ready-made community ready for them as they came into Bozeman, a network of people that they could readily count on when needed. So these symbols also tell us that people living in Bozeman during the 19th century were influenced by national trends, um, and especially natu national trends in literature, like the gates ajar. Um, and you know, just like we are today, influenced by, nat nat um, by um, national trends like the Harry Potter series. I'm kind of wondering, you know, probably if I did some more looking, I'd see that Deathly Hallows symbol on someone's headstone somewhere, or eventually will, maybe. Um, so it tells us that this group of people also love the beauty of the, the landscape and the nature of this place, because we see that represented on their headstones in the form of trees and plants and flowers. The community came together to build this town that we now get to enjoy and love. But I have to say, you know, um, it wasn't all sunshine and roses. Because, of course, um, um, as we like to say at Extreme History Project, history isn't always pretty. And by looking at the larger landscape of the cemetery, we can see that landscape is also symbolic. This is, like I said, the interactive map of Sunset Hill Cemetery. And by looking at the landscape of Sunset Hills, we see that most of Bozeman's early population are scattered throughout the old section. So kind of through this, this is all the old section of the cemetery. And all the headstones that I talked about today are all located over here. But the Chinese and Japanese gravestones of people who are living in early Bozeman, none of them are located over here. They're all located over here in this place that is set aside. And these are some of their headstones here. There's about seven or eight headstones and a few more people than there are headstones. So the symbolism of this landscape shows me that even with people moving into Bozeman from all over the world, there was still a group of people who were set outside the boundaries and buried in a separate location. This is not unusual. Um, this is not unusual in Montana. This happens all over Montana, in fact. Um, the Helena, um, uh, Forest Vale Cemetery actually has a whole distinct separate Chinese section. Uh, in Virginia City, the Chinese had their own separate cemetery. Um, so this happened all over Montana. So it's not something that is uh, distinct to Bozeman Cemetery. But one thing that is interesting and kind of distinct to Bozeman Cemetery is that within this old section, a lot of the ladies of the evening were put in um, in this cemetery, and they're just scattered all over here, and um, and and so they're kind of intermixed around with everybody else. But in um, some other cemeteries in Montana, they are regulated to the outside as well. So, what does that symbol symbolically tell you about Bozeman? I don't know. <laughs> well, actually, I do know what I'm going to tell. I'm going to do that presentation next week. <laughs> um, so I want to leave you tonight with a modern image. And this is not from Sunset Hill Cemetery, but this is from a cemetery in Wisconsin that holds much of my ancestral family, and I visited there this summer. To me, this Bruner headstone, I'm, I'm related to these folks, um, this Bruner headstone relates the symbolism of the Midwest with the rows of corn, the farmhouse, the barn, and the outbuildings dotting the landscape, the deer that you see kind of over here on the left-hand side, um, with the sun setting on the horizon, um, just like the sun was setting on the people who were buried under this headstone. I love this image. And you can actually see me reflected in the gravestone taking the photo. You can kind of see me back in here. I don't know, maybe you can't see me. But, um, can you? Okay. <laughs> and I wasn't going to use that the, the, this photo because of that. And then I thought, oh, that's actually, actually fits what I want to say here. So gravestones are not for the dead, but instead are for the living. These symbols relate the person's values, what was important to them in life, and communicates their intended, intended legacy after death. So, I encourage all of you to go out into a cemetery. It sounds like you all love to do that anyway. Whether it's Sunset Hills or an ancestral family cemetery, and look at what those people from the past are telling you about their lives. 
you'll be very glad you did. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming tonight. Civil War, and they all seem to be northern. Uh, have you found any that are southern, or is it a shame? Or you know, can you speak to that little yeah, story? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. So um, here in Sunset Hill Cemetery, we do have um, more northern um, people repre representing that symbolism on their cemetery on their headstones, and so maybe there was a little bit of that. Um, trying to forget that part of their past or trying to forget. We also had more Northerners that lived here in Bozeman. Um, but there are, um, there is, and I've looked for these in Sunset Hill and I haven't found them, but um, you'll notice that some of the headstones, the military headstones, have that rounded shape on the top. And they say that that was for the Northerners, kind of the rounded shape for the Civil War monuments. And then the Confederates had kind of a triangle shape on the top, and that's one way you can kind of tell them apart. And so, as far as I have found, there are no none of the kind of the kind of um, shaped that that sort of shaped um, headstone on the top in Sunset Hill Cemetery. But you know, there very well could be, yeah. And so, um, if you notice the headstone in the back, one of that headstone is from an Indian scout. Who, who was um, in the Indian Wars probably here in Montana, and he has kind of that rounded shape that I'm talking about. And I also want you to notice that headstone, when you see them in the, in the cemetery, they're, they're only about that tall. So that headstone shows how much is really beneath the earth in, in, in those headstones. So that was kind of interesting to me as well. So, yeah, and I didn't even touch on the military symbolism in headstones, that could be another <laughs> okay, more questions. Yes. On the photo of the black hole um, picture, it was pure, a pyramid. Pyramid, that yeah. That symbolic of something? Yeah, it sure is. So uh, Mary Blackmore um, was English, and she came here with her husband, uh, William Blackmore, and they came here for the Hayden Expedition in 1872, and she actually died here in Bozeman, and they had made a pact before they left Eng England that if one of them died, they would be buried in the place that they died, and she, so she was buried up in Sunset Hills. And so that headstone was not put up until a few years later. He sent money back to Bozeman to have them erect that headstone, but at that time, kind of in the, she died in 72, so the headstone was probably put up a, little, a few years later, Egyptian, um, Egyptian, the ideas of, and, and the art of the Egyptians was all in vogue. And so it could have been because of that, um, that pyramid shape, because of um, everybody kind of looking to Egyptian art, or it also could have been because um, they named Mount Blackmore after Mary and William Blackmore, more after Mary than William actually. And so to me, that headstone really looks like Mount Blackmore from, when you look at it from Bozeman, it has that triangle shape. So those are my two theories. <laughs> yes. What is your talk next week? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to the Montana Historical Society meeting in Helena, everyone should go, it's a great conference. It's the 20, uh, I think it's the 27th, 28th, 29th, somewhere in there. Just Google Montana History Conference, and I'm going to be giving a talk on the landscape of vice. 
And so gonna be talking about red light districts and kind of that landscape of, of this, these women's landscape that they operated in. You would love it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Well, bring it back to us some other day. <laughs> Say it again? Bring that lecture back. I know, maybe next year, yeah. That'll be a good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds good. All right, well, thanks everybody so much for coming out tonight.